So can you talk about what your style says about you? I mean, my clothing is my tool. It's like my fur, my feathers, my scales. It helps me access relationships with the world around me and the people in it. Clothing is a very powerful tool for you to help create an impression without saying anything. Dressing as society would deem a uh, cis white male to dress typically is the safest thing I can do in most scenarios. Cisgendered gay white man would be actually the next thing that I'm more accepted as. People will assume that I'm a gay man before they'll assume that I'm a woman. The next um, thing would be um, actually as a lesbian. I know that's funny, but people will respect me more if they think I'm a um, cisgendered lesbian woman. Um, than if they think I'm just an ugly woman. Um, I know that it sounds crazy, but they're like, oh, that's why you have short hair, that's why you like to wear this clothing. And then, surprisingly, trans man, then, um, then being a cisgendered heterosexual female or, and or bisexual female goes under trans man because a lot of people can accept the fact that they think I'm transitioning, then they can the fact that I just want to look this way. Um, and then the tier below that is being considered as a trans female. That's like the low, that's the bottom of the, that's the bottom. Can you just explain for people what that means? Just like yeah, so people you. think I, I am a man transitioning into being a woman. And I say man transitioning into being a woman with heavy quotes, by the way. Growing up, I thought it was a challenge. A lot of people called me Tranny Danny. I didn't know that it was a, tr it meant like somebody who is like transvestite or transsexual um, until like a few years later. But it was actually an episode of The Simpsons. Um, that like they were like tranny and like um, they said the word and I, I definitely, I, when I saw what it meant and my literal words were no fucking way. <laughs> Throws remote. And then I, I, then I was like, oh crap, oh man, my parents are gonna be so mad that I broke this remote. So um, I was like, gotta get out of the house, gotta get out of the house, <laughs> gotta get out of here. And I was like, okay, rain done. We're gonna talk this out. We're gonna walk through this right now. Like, and I processed it. Part of me didn't really feel surprised. Part of me was like, ah. Uh. But then a part of me felt like mad at myself for being so stupid and not, not cultured. But then part of me felt like I still could be the shit. I'm still awesome, still doing my thing. And I went into school and like, at first, like the first couple of times people said it, like in my brain, and I'm sure my eyes did that narrow thing, like Clint Eastwood, you know? Where it's like, I know what you mean when you said this, but um, I just figured, hey, this is like part of my training. You know, um, I'm not gonna let them have the satisfaction of knowing that like what they're saying is affecting me. This was not really the journey I had planned out actually what I'm doing right now. My journey was go to UC Berkeley, get my degree in engineering. Two weeks before I graduated college um, or university, I was going out to drinks with this person who happened to be working with DKNY at the time and they were a model and they're like, I bet you modeling is exactly where you need to be. I want you to go to a casting call of my choice when I say to go and it ended up being for Calvin Klein. And when I showed up, they were like, you're here on the wrong day. And I was Because they like, thought you were a guy. They thought I was a guy. They told me to come back the next day. And so I came back the next day, and then it was like all these guys, uh, you know, taking off their shirts, and that's what you do at a men's casting call. So what'd you do? Well, um, famously, I showed up late, and I was there at the very <laughs> tipped end of the thing, and so they didn't have me take off my shirt. I got cast. I show up to the show, oh. and then they hand me a pair of underwear, and so I'm sitting there with this pair of underwear, and they're like, Hey, um, like let's go. Like 20 minutes, we gotta go. We gotta get. We have to get moving. Um, and I was like, okay. Um, and they're like, come on, put on your outfit. And I'm like, I'm waiting for it. And like, this is it. And I look at this underwear. And I look around. And I look at all the other guys. And I realize, oh shit, this is a men's underwear show. And I walk out there, only underwear, no bra, no shirt, no shoes or any boobs out. Boobs out. It was a run through. To be fair. And so I'm walking down the runway, my tits are doing this, like, side to side, and the casting director is just like, oh my god. He looked like he was going to shit himself. And he came up to me, and I knew it, why he was coming up to me. He knew why he was coming up to me. We knew that it was like a western, like, standoff. What's he gonna say? How is he gonna say it? How am I gonna take it? What am I gonna say? And he says, is this your first time modeling? I go, yes. He goes, I couldn't tell. You're amazing. I was like, oh, thank you. Well, thank you. He goes, you're actually so much better than these other male amateur models. And I'm like, thank you. And he goes, you're actually so good that unlike them, I think you could work more clothing. So then they put out this blast um, that, but what you didn't know is that one of these models is actually a woman. Suddenly all these uh, people started reaching out to me and asking me to model. And I kept saying no, it's, it was the worst thing you could possibly ask me to do. Oh, stand in front of a camera and like strut around. And by turning people down, it caused people to come to me and say, well, would you do it for $500? And I'd be like, 
yeah, of course I'll do it. I'll be uncomfortable. I mean, I don't know if you're gonna want the photos you're gonna get from it, but for $500, of course, by not taking any free work, which a lot of models would do, and like not being desperate and being like, oh my God, I'll work with you. I was putting a price, a value on myself. Is there any area of your life that you like do still struggle with like fearing judgments from other people? I'm always having a really hard time. Even in this interview, I'm like, I want to make sure that I'm saying things that people can understand and relate to, but I don't want to disenfranchise any particular group in the very beginning of my career. Um, when people are like, well, how do, what about menswear? How do you feel when you wear menswear? And I'm like, well, when I put menswear on my body, my tits don't fall off. So therefore, it becomes women's wear the minute I wear it. It becomes my wear. And for me, I was trying to say something pretty empowering, which is like, clothing doesn't have gender. And the trans community was like, really offended. People with breast cancer were really offended that tits don't make a woman, mm. um, tits don't make a man. So it was such a humbling thing. I went home, I cried about it. I'm like, why don't people see that I, d I had really good intentions? And I realized like, it's because I have the privilege of being thrust into a place where I have a broad voice and platform. And so it is my job, part of my job right now is to educate myself as much as I possibly can. And also part of my job is to take in that education and take in the shit. What's your biggest fear? I don't really have anything I'm super afraid of. When I was a wilderness firefighter, I had this experience. We were hot shots, so you get airlifted in, and you have to cut down these trees um, and create what's called a fire break. So when the fire hits it, it's like a lower point, you know, for the flame, so you can easier chance of putting it out. And the tree fell on top of all of us. Broken collarbone, broken foot, yeah. like, yeah, broken thumb, which surprisingly was the worst. My whole, like, this whole side of my body, right? Then, um, Colin, he was just, like, all kinds of messed up. And with the stick coming right through his chest, it had, um, like, hit one of his lungs. So he was, like, you know, blood was coming out and all this stuff. And then we also had um, this other person, Anya, and she was the opposite of me. So I had all of this, and she had all of this like on the other side. I put down this fire blanket with like one awkward hand and um, like we rolled ourselves in it like a burrito. Like, uh, the blaze came over. Anya's feet were stick, one foot was sticking out of the, of the fire blanket by mistake. And so her foot literally like burned off in the flame. I'm the only one with my helmet on and it singed, started singeing into the side of my head. As this was happening, I looked at Colin and um, I had my fingers in his throat and he was like going, he was like going through like this, like convulsing kind of thing. And I thought burning alive would be the worst way to go. And I had this weird moment where I'm like, if I just, he would drown to death in his own blood. And then that would probably be a way less painful way to die. And then I'm like, no, we're going to wait this out. And we managed to make it like all the way through. But by the time the fire crew came, Colin, they took him because he was a priority, but they only had room on the helicopter for two because they only had room for two stretchers. So one person had to wait. And they looked at Anya and I, and like we had very similar injuries. Obviously hers were more dire because of the foot, but they didn't make the decision of which one of us to take based on injury assessment because it was like so fast. They did it, they're like, just take the like ladies first. And I thought that was such an interesting thing because they took the woman before they took me. I resolved myself to kill somebody. I resolved myself to kill myself. I resolved myself to die. And I think when you get to that point where you're like, this is it, um, then you're just kind of like, there's this, there's this incredible peace and this incredible feeling. And um, it kind of like every time I walk out, I'm like, I'm not, what's gonna happen? Oh, you're gonna say something to try to hurt my feelings. Oh, you're gonna hit me. What's gonna happen when you hit me? When is the last time you cried? Ah, uh, well, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> I mean, uh, the last time I cried, you? I'm well, a little misty. I mean, it's hard to think about it. It is like a humbling thing to think of like that whole experience and like, how much that really does change your life. And then I also get a little misty eyed when I think about how much I wish people could feel the way I feel. Cause it's like, there's so much bullshit. It gets in so much of the way of like this incredible thing. The fact that you live it all is amazing. And we don't have any proof that we've ever existed. And we don't have any proof that we ever will exist. We're only here right now and now and now and now. It's just so, it's so incredible. I wish people could just like be right here Take instead of like, being, you know, pulling their past with them and then being afraid of like their future, you know? Even I have my own insecurities about like what's going to happen, but I feel very at peace right now because I know that whatever's going to happen, what's happening right now is the only thing that will ever happen in my life and that's what I need to focus on.
but it's hard. As somebody who's moved around a lot and somebody who's experienced these different kinds of experiences, um, you know, friends are hard to come by and people are hard to come by. And so the loss of people in my life is something that's really difficult, I think, to deal with sometimes. Sometimes you, your thoughts don't align with other people's needs and you need to let them walk away. When we lose people in our life, we sometimes lose faith that more people will come into our life and that's a really hard, it's a really hard thing, but you have to let, you have to let it go. Sure. <laughs> sure? Okay. When do you feel the most vulnerable? When do I feel most vulnerable? Um, modeling makes me feel extremely vulnerable um, and doing interviews like this make me feel extremely vulnerable. As I evolve and I evolve my language and I evolve my thoughts and I evolve my space in this world, this will always be there and that can make me feel really vulnerable because I know that I still have such a journey to go on. Why in your body, in your like skin, in your journey, like why is it good? Sometimes the way that, that, that I am isn't like aesthetically pleasing or fuckable to other people, but that doesn't make me feel ugly. And sometimes it is like very fuckable and aesthetically pleasing to other people. And that, that's like a nice compliment. The reason why I like being in this body is because I've grown with this body. This is not really what I am, but it's how I can have an experience in this world and in this life. This is just an expression of what we are from how we move our hands to how we walk to how we talk. Um, it's this and then our underwear, then our clothing, you know what I mean? How do you feel now? How do I feel now? Um, surprisingly not cold, that was nice. I mean, I feel like I should be paying you for this session. <laughs> like, thank you so much. <laughs> I've solved a lot of my um, you know, problems. Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel pretty, feel pretty good.